Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Center Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Alejandro Sanchez Franks, and today I'm joined by Dr. Charlotte Williams to learn about how we study the health of the shelf seas and the methods we use to measure them. So welcome, Charlotte. Uh, it's really good to see you. Oh, thanks for having me on. Um, you've been doing some really cool stuff this week, haven't you? Has it been the glider workshop? Yes. So, um, so I'm based at the National Oceanography Center in Liverpool. But I've got to come down uh, this week um, because I work with the autonomous ro robotic fleet of uh, gliders. So these like little yellow um, autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, and what I've been learning to do is measure turbulence using those gliders, so mixing in the ocean. So they've been showing us how the, we put these instruments on the robots and um, process the data and work out how much mixing there is basically in the ocean. Wow, why is, yeah. and why is it important for us to understand mixing in the ocean? So, um, so the area that I work in, I'm really interested in how the physics links through to um, like the biology, um, specifically around the coast, um, the coastal seas around the UK. Um, so it's important to understand how mixing can um, impact uh, the uh, availability of things like nutrients to um, the plants that grow in the surface ocean uh, phytoplankton. So you mentioned the coastal areas. Yes. That's your expertise, isn't it? The shelf, the shelf seas and the yeah. coast? Yeah, so I haven't worked anywhere tropical, uh, unlike, uh, or polar. Uh, <laughs> all of my research has been around the UK. So um, I'm really interested in an area called, called the shelf seas. So it's, shelf seas are a region that links our coasts to the deep ocean. So typically less than about 200 meters depth um, they're very variable. They're like I said, they they link um, the impacts of humans right through to the deep ocean. Uh, they're very energetic. Um, they're, they're actually super interesting around the UK because because um, we live in a temperate area. Um, they experience seasons. So the shelf seas around uh, the UK uh, experience like a spring, summer, autumn, winter, which impacts. You, we see that in. Um, blooms and growth of the phytoplankton and stuff in the in the ocean so mm. that's really interesting uh i'm just picking up on the fact that you mentioned tropical and polar um, yeah. you, you know here at the national oceanography center we do sort of the global oceans yeah. but it's really interesting to hear about this segment or group subgroup that we have that's looking very specifically at the uk coast and how yeah. it impacts england um, so can you talk a little bit about that, about sort of why, why should anyone here care about the shelf seas? <laughs> um, well, so our shelf seas, I'm trying to remember this. So the UK shelf seas, I think are worth about near 47, 47 billion. I think it's 47 billion pounds. Holy mackerel. So, um, and generally shelf seas, 90% of the fish that's caught comes from shelf seas. Um, they're typically more, they've got higher rates of production. So that means like the, the primary producers, the phytoplankton, um, the rates at which they produce is um, three to five, three to five times higher in shelf seas than it is in the open ocean. Um, I'm trying to think um, if there's anything else that's super interesting, but yeah, around around the UK, our shelf seas are pretty, pretty important um, for, uh, lots of stuff we rely on yeah are there any um major differences as you go around the shelf seas in the uk um just going from south to north as it changes uh as you get a little bit more subpolar uh yeah or, or is there a specific region that you're focused on in the yeah in the so shelf? a lot of my work's been around the north sea and the irish sea and the celtic sea so um and obviously um i'll talk a little bit later about some of the projects that uh the future projects we're working on um but obviously we're there's starting to be um lots of wind farms and offshore wind farms um being developed in those areas um yeah they're typically super variable uh i can't remember what sorry what did you ask me again i'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's sorry. all right i'm the po same polar, yeah. i'm just um wondering if there's a specific region that you're focusing on and you did answer that you're yeah, talking yeah. a bit more about the, the nordic seas is yeah. there a specific science question that you're looking at? Yeah, so I'm really interested, as I said, like the link to the, from the physics through to um, like the biogeochemistry, we call it. So um, things like nutrients and uh, oxygen. So oxygen, I mean, uh, it's been reported quite widely that oxygen over the global ocean is has been decreasing. So part of the reason because of that is because 
um, cold, cold water holds m more oxygen than warm water. So as the oceans warm, they actually lose oxygen. Um, and in shelf seas, like I said about these seasons, so um, in the spring, when uh, the shelf seas, when the ocean gets a bit warmer, you get a warm layer of water sat on top of a cold layer of water. Um, and in that cold, deep layer, um, there's not much growth happening down there and oxygen being produced by the plants. Um, and it kind of acts as like a lid. So oxygen starts decreasing. Um, so it gets yeah, lower um, in that deeper water. So the longer that lid sits on top, so it's called stratification, the longer that lid sits on top of that deep water, the longer it's isolated from the atmosphere and it's uh, not in contact with uh, being ventilated by oxygen. And there's evidence to suggest around our coast that um, that stratification, so those seasons, spring and summer, when um, the water column stratified, are lasting longer and that stratification is uh, becoming stronger. So we're getting longer springs and summers, basically, in the shelf seas. So if I'm getting this right, as the oceans are getting warmer, mm -hmm. this difference between the warmer surface layer and the cooler one creates a bit more stratification. And because mm. you have that difference in those temperatures, it's harder yeah. to mix. That's Yeah, yeah. And it's as you say, it's acting as a lid. Yeah. So then as as the layers below lose oxygen, they don't get a chance they to They don't replenish, replenish it, yeah, up. yeah. And then in the winter, the whole water column book, it's basically like competition between um, mixing by the wind and the tides and um, heating from the sun. So in the winter, um, when there's not enough heating, the mixing from the wind and the tides mixes the water column up, it wins the competition. And then in the spring and the summer, um, uh, heating from the sun stratifies it. So I'm interested in the, the processes that might um, maintain that strength and um, that lid on top of the um, deep water. The sort of and, seasonal cycle of it. Yeah, and the processes that might, uh, the turbulence, so the mixing that um, occurs between those two layers, things that can drive those. Um, so you can get like breaking waves. So um, light waves on the surface, you can get internal waves between those two layers, of warm water, warm water on the top, cold water on the bottom. And when they break, they can mix oxygen below and nutrients from the bottom up to the warmer surface layers. So, yeah. So I think I'm following. Sorry, <laughs> that's, Sorry, it's no, no. that's no, that's really interesting. Um, and I'm just thinking now about how you mentioned that with that seasonal cycle, what you're seeing now is that the stratification lasts for longer periods of time. Did I get that? Yeah. That right? So some some of the um, some scientists that um, is that, at is the that knock, yeah 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 um, climate change. Yeah. So with um, with uh, due to anthropogenic warming of the ocean. Um, yeah, that strength of uh, stratification is inc the intensity and the duration, basically. Yeah. So. And that's because and they, the oceans are warming. Is that yeah. right? Mm. Yeah. So what kind of do you think that this uh, change in the seasonal stratification has has it has it been a recent change or what, what has the, the this sort of look like in the last 50 years? Um, I can't tell you exactly. Uh, there's some uh, there's few colleagues who've been working on that and modeling that um i think the last i think the length of uh so that's stratified season it's um increased by something like five to ten days so and that will yeah uh, that, that must have a huge impact on fisheries i would imagine if it's changing the oxygen availability and the nutrient and the biogeochemical cycle yeah so it'll have an impact on all of the um yeah the ecosystem mm. Wow. Uh, yeah, so we need to be able to monitor that um, and measure um, things like oxygen and nutrients and phytoplankton throughout seasons and make sure we've got good measurements that uh, so we know what's going on around the coast. Um, can I ask you a bit more about how you take the measurements? That's a really exciting, that's some really exciting stuff. Do you use the gliders you were mentioning earlier? Yeah, so I think we've deployed around the shelf seas uh, of the UK. Uh, projects that I've been involved in, I think now it's in the 30s or 40 gliders. So we've got two going in next. We've got two in at the, at the moment um, and we've got two going in in April to measure this spring bloom. Um, 
yeah, so the gliders uh basically they're about 60 65 they weigh less than me but not much less than me <laughs> um kilos and in but in the water they weigh um less than a bag of sugar so they use they kind of look like little um little planes bright yellow and um they what they do is they they can't change their mass so they're about you know, like i said 65 kilo but um they can change their density by changing their volume so they have uh, like a little bladder in um and they push oil and they can change their volume which changes their density and then that that ch changes yeah the density in the water so they can move up and down with very low energy um so that means that we can put them in the water with sensors to measure things for months at a time rather than uh going out on a going out on a ship is really expensive as you know and um it involves scientists going out and taking lots of measurements but um with gliders, we can put them out for months and they send data back. So they have communication with the satellite. So we can talk to them on the shore and pilot them and tell them where to go. And, we, um, and they can send us data back. So we can say, oh, that looks interesting. Stay there, um, you know, measure this more frequently or um, move over to this area. So we can um, pilot them depending on what we're seeing in real time, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of scientists at the NOC who've been developing them. We've got like the Marine Autonomous Robotic Systems Centre here. So we've got, uh, who, we've got a huge fleet of gliders and um, a whole suite of different sensors so we can measure things like uh, temperature, salinity, which um, yeah, obviously tells us uh, a lot about the physics. Um, and we can measure chlorophyll fluorescence, which tells us about the phytoplanktons, the little plants in the ocean, uh, nutrients, oxygen, we can um, put, as I've said, I've been learning how to measure turbulence. So, um, yeah, we can equip the gliders with um, those sensors. Um, yeah, so we can yeah measure quite a bit with them um, and see it. It's just, it just um, gives us a huge amount of data, a huge amount. Mm. So I feel like I might regret asking this, but uh, how did the how did the micro or the turbulence sensors work? This is like a quiz. So I've, just <laughs> learned, I've literally just learned how to... Yeah, so um, they have shear probes on, so they measure... This, yeah, this is a test. The, yeah, the, the variance. Um, so they measure very, very small, um, like, vibrations, like changes in the uh, current. So they can... And they can, that can tell you about um, how big the uh, mixing... Uh, is and how much dissipation there is of turbulent kinetic energy yeah which yeah tells us tells us scientists how much mixing is going on mm. that's really good um and so then from that you'll learn something about the stratification how much mixing is happening in that layer yeah is yeah the and idea? You can, yeah and you can calculate fluxes you can calculate how much so you know how, how much oxygen is being mixed downwards how much um nutrients are being mixed upwards and or or temperature or salt as well so any kind of like property you can yeah use those um measurements of mixing to tell you about how much is being transferred between certain uh, layers of the ocean so we've got a fleet of gliders out there in the shelf seas they're mm -hmm. measuring um i think it's the top thousand meters uh so the shelf, shelf seas typically less than 200 meters i know that we've got some um <clears throat> gliders and all aut uh, autonomous vehicles measuring deeper like the, the i mean the auto sub can go really deep um but yeah mine are the ones that i work with are typically less than a couple of hundred meters but it takes um, so very much focused on the surface yeah um yeah so they um uh, they we typically fly them about they've got like an altimeter on so they know where the seabed is and then they can turn at, you know 10 meters from the bed and they'll do these kind of seesaw profiles using um so yeah as i said changing their buoyancy and using uh the lift to um direct them um, and um, I didn't mention, yes, yeah, so they've got like a battery in them and they move that up and down and that changes the angle that they fly. Um, um, I can't remember what I was going to say. Sorry, I've got... Um... That's all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, and then they surface. Sorry, so they, they'll keep diving. Um, they travel, I think it's like about point three meters per second so they're quite slow and then they go on the surface and they'll sit on the surface send their data so you get that we'll data in real time yeah and yeah and so um yeah we can talk to them and then 
they go back down um, and then they'll pop back up. We can tell them how often we want them to pop up and stuff to avoid you know, marine traffic and things like that. So we mm. don't want them sat on the surface for too long. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, um, so these are all presumably linked to some projects you said you were going to, you, you've been working on recently? Yeah, yeah. So we've got, um, so obviously offshore wind is like a huge, um, huge thing, um, renewable energy and, um, you know, uh, net zero capability um, for the NOC as well. Um, so what's some, um, so just a general question, what's net zero capability? <laughs> Um, so trying to um, reduce our carbon f- footprint to zero, basically, with the science that we, we do. Um, yeah, um, so obviously using autonomous vehicles um, is very helpful with that because we can collect lots of measurements. Um, yeah, um, so the wind farm project that I'm working on, so it's part of a, so EcoWind um three projects funded in the UK and the scientists from the NOC involved in every, every one, which is great, um, linking um, offshore wind to the impacts on the ecosystem, the, the impacts that offshore wind is having on the ecosystem, basically. Um, and the project I'm working on is called Pelagio, so it's physics through to uh, ecosystem level um, assessment of offshore wind. Um, so we're trying to link what I said, the impacts of offshore wind on the mixing in the water column and how that links through to um, the nutrients, the oxygen, the phytoplankton. And then there's some scientists who are then linking that through to prey availability of like small fish, mackerel and sand eels and things. And um, linking that through to bird feeding um, behavior. Oh, wow. So you have these areas where birds feed, where there's like mixing hotspots because there's lots of phytoplankton. So it's linking all the way through from the physics through to, to birds and uh, looking at the impact that wind might have on, uh, wind offshore wind farms have on that. Because obviously you're taking energy out of the system yeah. um, to go into the wind farm. So that's going to have a, an impact. And of the structures themselves as well are going to have an impact on the mixing that's happening downstream. Hmm. Are you working with with the wind farm industry as part of this this yes. project? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, very yeah, cool. Yeah, so, so yeah, very a very direct route into climate impact and policy. Yeah, and so policy, uh, yeah. yeah, policy um, on taking measurements to protect protect our coast as well, because obviously, um, yeah, the impacts of uh, anthropogenic impacts go through to the shelf so, yeah. so what do you think the next uh, five or ten years are going to look like in shell sea science or your career specifically um i'm hoping the um the use of autonomous vehicles using the gliders um and linking those through because we get the data in real time people who use um numerical models so using computers to predict what we think is going to happen in the future with climate change um and yeah, changing changing environments, um, using uh, data collected from those to um, help make predictions about how our ocean is changing. Um, but yeah, my research, hopefully, yeah, still working um, with gliders um, and doing more and more in intelligent things. So yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thank you for joining us today, Charlotte. If you'd like to learn more about our work with Shell Seas and some excited methods, uh, please head to the website, noc.ac.uk. And to ensure that you don't miss out on future Into the Blue episodes, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. See you in the next episode.